Let's pray. Lord, our God, how good it is to gather with your people, to gather in this place on this day, to honor you, Lord, to celebrate the great work of the gospel that you have done in our hearts, to bring us from death to life, to know you, to belong to you. And Lord, I pray this morning as we look at your word, as we dive in, God, would you impress on our hearts the richness of the privilege of knowing you. We could do that as you only can by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is really good to, uh, to be with you. Uh, so good to, uh, to, uh, to sing with you and worship with you. Church, you sound so good. Uh, just singing to the Lord, and uh, man, it ministers to my heart. I just trust it ministers to yours as well. So thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Michael White. I get to serve as one of the pastors here, do most of the preaching and teaching, uh, but not all of it. Uh, we're a church that's led by a plurality of pastors, and so you'll see various guys in this spot. But uh, if you're a guest with us today, it's say welcome. And uh, we're glad you're, you're here. We hope you feel uh, safe and at home. So if you're joining us online today, too, I want to say welcome. Glad you're here, and we'd love to have you here in person uh, as well. So uh, if, you, um, if you guys are familiar with Shaquille O'Neal, remember him? Like, like that guy, you look at a guy like that, and you think, man, he has everything. Like, you know Sha- Shaquille O'Neal, right? Like, he's seven foot one, uh, four-time NBA champion. It feels like he's everywhere again as a pitch man in his retirement. Uh, he's been a, uh, a rapper, uh, a, a DJ, an actor, a sports commentator, uh, a, a businessman. At one point, um, he owned 155 Five Guys franchises, 150 car washes, uh, seven Auntie Anne's pretzel stands, nine Papa John's, uh, 40 24 hour fitness gyms, 18 Shaq's Big Chicken restaurants. Like, this guy has done well. Uh, for himself, his estimated net worth is like $400 million. So he feels like Shaq is everywhere. But success doesn't necessarily satisfy, does it? Shaq describes in a podcast uh, here in the last couple of years how he lost his marriage and he lost basically everything that really mattered. Um, here's, here's what he says. This is his words. He says about his marriage, I was bad. I was bad. She was awesome. She really was. It was all me, he says. I wasn't protecting her and protecting those vows. Really candid and self-reflective. At the time, Shaq and his family were living in a, get this, a 72,000 square foot house. 12 bedrooms, 15 baths, 6,600 square foot indoor basketball court, 95 foot long indoor luxury pool, theater room, 17 car garage, among other things. It's like, holy smokes, right? But again, looking back on that time, listen to what Shaq says. He says, man, the best feeling for me was coming home and hearing in the home five, six different voices, her wife and children. He says, it didn't matter that I had missed 15 free throws, which if you remember his playing career in the NBA, he missed tons of free throws, right? It didn't matter if I'd missed 15 free throws and we lost. They don't care about that. He says, my wife was finer than a mug and I had it all. And then, I'm just quoting him here, all right? Then I messed up. I messed up. And then when I didn't have that, I was lost. 76,000 square foot house by yourself lost no kids go to that huge gym nobody's playing in the gym you go to their room nobody's there you start to feel it he said Shaq's experience shows that it is not what you have it's who you have, right? It, it, it's not what you've done or how much you've accomplished. It's actually who you belong to and who belongs to you. Well, this morning we're in Luke chapter 10. We're typically what we do here at Freedom is we walk through books of the Bible. And so we've been in the book of Luke for a little while, uh, just had taken a break over the summer, and we've just jumped back into it now. And this is the place where you heard Crystal read, Jesus sends out the 72 
uh, 72 of his followers, he sent them out on mission. And as they are sent out on mission, they find great success. And there, there's a lot of things in this text, a lot of rabbit trails we could chase that I'll try not to do today. But here's what I, I think Luke wants us to see, what I want to convince you of from this text. And here it is, main point if you want to take notes and write something down. Here's, here, here it is. Belonging to Jesus is better than anything we do for Jesus. Belonging to Jesus is better than anything we do for Jesus. No, no matter what success we enjoy, no matter what power or responsibilities that we are given, knowing Jesus and indeed being known by him, that is better. And so as we drop down into this text, last week we saw he was giving some instructions about what it looks like for disciples to follow him. Now, having given all that, he's going to send them out on mission. And so if you're a Christian here this morning, you need to understand that it, you're a disciple of Jesus and you have a mission. But as we look at this text, you need to understand that the mission that these disciples of Jesus have is not the exact same as yours. What happens here in Luke chapter 10 is a particular commissioning in a particular moment of Jesus's ministry. Be that as it may, both their mission and your mission, our mission, if you're a Christian, really matters. So let's see that first off. Your mission matters. Just look there at verse 1, Luke chapter 10. After this, after he's given those instructions about what it means to follow him, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. So just a reminder... Jesus has set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to die, to bear God's wrath, to redeem all who would believe in him. And Jesus is making his way there from the hill country in northern Galilee down to Jerusalem, where there's still hills. Um, but as he's making his way down there, of course he's going to minister all along the way. And so he sends out his followers out ahead of him. In politics, they'd call this an advanced team, right? You go into a city, you set up, you do all the preparation, so then the politician, the figure, Jesus here, can, can come in. I'm not saying Jesus is a politician. Don't, don't get confused. Um, he, he previously, though, has done something like this with the 12 disciples, right? So if you go back to Luke chapter 9, at the very beginning, he calls the 12 together, and he gives them power and authority over all the demons and to cure all diseases— and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And so he's done that with the 12. And all that is not said explicitly in our text here in Luke 10. But as we go through, we're going to see that these 72 are given the same kind of power and authority that the 12 have been given. And so Luke chapter 10, verse 2, now he says, the harvest is plentiful. He says this is 72. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And so their mission that he is commissioning them on and sending them out to do is to declare the dawn of the long-awaited kingdom. When God is going to gather his people in a particular place so that they would live under his rule and blessing. The dawn of that kingdom was near. That's what his followers were supposed to declare. And there are many people to be gathered into that kingdom. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus said, but there aren't enough workers. But notice in verse 2, it's God's harvest, right? A couple of times it says that. It's God's harvest. Their job is therefore just to ask him to send workers. And so isn't this interesting? God is sending them on this mission. Jesus is sending them on this mission. He knows what they need. It's his harvest. And yet... Jesus' instruction is that they should pray. They should ask the Father to give what's needed. And this is just an interesting dynamics here, right? Like, God, of course, is going to accomplish his mission. And he doesn't need you or me or them. Yet, the mission depends on us to pray. It's an interesting thing how, how prayer and God's sovereignty works there. 
he's going to do his mission it's going to happen but we need to pray that he would send workers so that the mission happens so just stew on that sometime now come though the specific instructions here in chapter 10 verse 3 he says go your way these 72 gathered go your way behold i'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves in other words they should expect opposition and danger that that's part of the deal that he's sending them out into verse 4 carry no money bag no knapsack no sandals greet nobody on the road in other words they are to travel quick and light be totally at the mercy of others not even to bring an extra pair of sandals in case what they got breaks wears out not supposed to stop along the way and, and chat it up with folks but rather verse 5 whatever house you enter first say peace be to this house and, and if a son of peace is there your, your peace will rest upon him but if not it will return to you your, your saying will come right back to you and remain in the same house eating and drinking what they provide for the laborer deserves his wages do not he says go from house to house whenever you enter a town and they receive you eat what is set before you so a couple of things there first notice the message the message that they are to preach is a pe is a message of peace which in the hebrew concept is, is the word shalom it, it's not just the absence of conflict like we might think nowadays peace means there's no war that, that's not it shalom peace in this concept is the presence of everything that's good security stability wholeness completion that's what the kingdom is about and so they're to come and preach peace peace and, and they're to stay where they're received where they find someone who is is open uh, to what they're sharing maybe even like-minded so they shouldn't house hop as soon as they find that person they're to stay there and so if the menu at that house is beanie weenies and sloppy joes all right well that's the menu that's what we're eating right they shouldn't go hunting fettuccine alfredo or chicken piccata or whatever else right they don't don't be looking for softer beds or better food or, or whatever jesus says no stay and eat what's set before you where you are verse 9 heal the sick say to them here's the message the kingdom of God has come near to you. And so they're to heal. The healings that they were performing are authenticating signs that demonstrate the validity of their message. Like, it's one thing to run around saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here, right? It's another thing to actually have something to demonstrate the validity of what you're saying. And so just like Jesus had announced back in Luke 4, the inbreaking, the dawn of God's kingdom is going to be accompanied by signs that show what life will be like in his kingdom. Meaning there is no more sickness. There is no more evil. There is no more disability. There is no more slavery or captivity. And so they're doing these signs to authenticate, confirm the message that they are declaring. But what happens when People don't want to hear the message. Well, verse 10 gets to that. Whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we will wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, even if you don't want to believe it, in other words, the kingdom of God has come near. And Jesus says, I tell you, it will become more bearable on that day for Sodom for that town Sodom and Gomorrah which experienced the furious wrath of God there in Genesis and so the mission that they have matters because they are delivering an urgent message that has consequences if it's not received this is important work that they need to do now friends that are gathered here this morning like, we have an analogous mission it, it's not exactly the same and it's not accompanied by signs, unfortunately. But we're declaring that the king has come and is returning. More fully than they declared, we are inviting all people to be gathered in to God's people. And so we, as Christians, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago. I showed you three circles, just as one method to demonstrate the story of, of how God is redeeming brokenness and making all things new. 
And so we extend Jesus' invitation to all who are weary and need rest. We extend Jesus' invitation to all who mourn and are longing for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder, is there even a God who cares? To, to all who sin and need a Savior. We're inviting all of those people to come to Christ, to, to find Him, the mighty friend of sinners, the Jesus who came to live and die and buy our pardon, who absorbed the punishment that we deserve by our rebellion on the cross. And then He rose from the dead to secure life both right now and forevermore for those who believe in Him. That is the message more fully that we get to declare than even the message that they declared. And so, friends, that is our holy privilege. That is our message, and we have been commissioned to go with this message to make disciples of all nations, to baptize whoever believes, right? To teach them to obey what Jesus taught. It's the Great Commission, Matthew 28. And that is an urgent mission. It matters that we speak of Jesus as we go. As a matter of fact, if you're here this morning and you have yet to turn from your sins, if you're yet to place your faith in Jesus, I just want to invite you. I just want to urge you to believe in him even right now. You just, you just heard me summarize what he had done. He came to rescue you from your rebellion against God. So I would encourage you to turn from your rebellion, repent, and believe in him. And if you don't know how to do that, we'll encourage you to talk to somebody around you, because somebody around you, I'm sure, can help you. If you've already believed in Jesus, then get on it, right? Because the mission matters. The mission matters. That's what we see from this. They have an urgent mission that they must carry out. We have an urgent mission that we must carry out. And on top of that, the responsibility we have towards others is real. Like, what you do, this is point two, what you do with the message, both in receiving it yourself and in stewarding it with other people who are in your lives, that is a huge responsibility. Because to reject the word of Jesus, just like those villages where they're shaking the dust off their feet, to, to reject the word of Jesus is to put yourself in the path of the fearsome judgment of God so listen to what Jesus says in um, verse 13 he says woe to you Chorazin woe to you Bethsaida for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon they would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and ashes but it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you and, and you Capernaum will, will you be exalted to heaven no, you shall be brought down to Hades. And so what's going on here? Well, Chorazin and Bethsaida and the Capernaum are all towns on the northern edge of the, of the Sea of Galilee, the very places where Jesus has been running around like crazy, ministering and teaching. Signs have been worked there. Like the might and majesty of God has been on display. And guess what? Still they don't believe still they don't believe and because those cities have clearly heard the truth and even seen evidence of the truth and rejected it the disproportionate amount of revelation they have received is going to lead to disproportionate wrath from God for rejecting it and so let me put it to you like this I, back a uh, number of years ago now I worked in uh, Yosemite National Park it was the most awesome summer job you possibly could have I made beds in hotel rooms and clean toilets and then I like got to hike like every day it was amazing um, and, and Yosemite National Park at the time this is back when you could still drive into the park you can't do that anymore but back then when you could drive into it the, the park service and the concessionaire warned tourists like a thousand different times as you're coming in not to leave food or, or even something that looked like it could be food like a cooler or a 
box or an empty Chick-fil-A bag or a tube of toothpaste, right? Don't leave anything like that in your car overnight or else when you come back to your car in the morning, you're going to come to a broken window. Why? Well, Yosemite Valley is crawling with bears, crawling with bears who are strong and smart and always and have a great sense of smell and are always looking for an easy meal. And so listen, there was warning after warning after warning with videos, like when you're like checking in to wherever you're checking in a hotel or, or whatever, like videos playing of like bears like brushing, brushing windows. There's pictures and still, like every morning, you'd walk out to the parking lot, and what would you see? Broken glass. And, and it, it became, not that I was callous, um, but I was young then, uh, it just kind of became like hard to feel bad for them, right? Because they had been told, they had been warned so many times. That's the kind of thing that's happening to Chorazin and Bethsaida in Capernaum they have been told they've heard what's more these are Jewish cities who should have been expecting the Jewish Messiah Jesus who should have seen what was happening and heard what was being preached and connected the dots between the kingdom that had been that was being proclaimed to them and the scriptures that they should have known so Jesus says, listen, on the day of judgment, it's going to be better off to be over there in these wicked pagan cities who don't have the benefits that they had, don't have the scriptures, don't have all the revelation, like Tyre and Sidon. He says, listen, even those cities, if they'd had what you had, they would have repented and believed by now. Jesus in, encourages the 72, verse 16. The one who hears you hears me. In other words, they're declaring a word from him. But then the one who rejects you is rejecting me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So he's helping them understand, hey, this is not personal. When they're rejecting you, they're rejecting me and they're rejecting the Father. And so the urgency to believe the gospel is real. And I would just again appeal to you, if you're here this morning and you've not believed in Christ, like you, you need to believe. I would urge you and implore you to do that. But beyond that, if you are a Christian, the responsibility that we have to, to share the gospel, to communicate the truth that we have been given it is real. It's weighty. And, and having said all that, as we work through this text, we come to find out, though, that there is something more important than the mission. There is something more weighty and more glorious than that heavy responsibility that I just talked about, more valuable than any success that the mission that we have could, could possibly have. Point three, your belonging is better. Your mission matters. Your responsibility is real, but your belonging to Jesus is better. Just stick with me here. Watch how the mission ends up. Verse 17, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They can't believe it. Like, can you imagine these 72 people, right? Like they've been soaking up Jesus' teaching, watching how he's healing and rebuking evil and just doing all these amazing things. And all of a sudden he's like, hey, y'all come on. Now you get to go do this. I mean, how cool would that be, right? It's like they moved up from the practice squad into the starting lineup. Right? Like, man, I'm going to get to be in the game. I'm going to be on the field. And not only that, as they go out into the field, into the mission, they crush it. Like, wow, this is amazing. And so they return with joy to Jesus. They're just like ecstatic with their success. I mean, what a moment. 
And they're just bubbling up with joy and excitement and energy. But Jesus' response, I think, is the key that unlocks all of this. All of this. Because again, there's an urgent mission and there's real responsibility. And first he says to them, verse 18, Yeah, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. In other words, he affirms, Yes, you do have that authority. Yes, Satan's days are numbered. Yes, the dawn of the kingdom of God is the beginning of the end of Satan's run as the God of this world. That's all really good, right? It's all really exciting. But that's not the really big deal that Jesus wants them to focus on. That's not the thing that they should be so overjoyed about. Look at verse 20. Nevertheless, he says, all that stuff is true, but nevertheless, do not rejoice in that, that the spirits are subject to you. But what? Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What is worth rejoicing in is not what you do for Jesus. It's not the ability to heal people, although that undoubtedly would have been very cool, right? It's not the ability to cast out demons, although again, how fun would that be? Like, I don't even know what that would be like. That's not the big deal. None of that, Jesus says, should stir your emotions, should fill you with joy, what should grip your heart, he says. What should make your eyes, as it were, well up with tears and fill you with wonder and delight is this, that your name is written in heaven. Rejoice, he says, that your names are written in heaven. Belonging to Jesus is better than anything you do for Jesus. And what's amazing, what's amazing is that that's what Jesus rejoices in too. That's what he's excited about. That same hour, verse 21, in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Jesus' joy isn't all the great things that are happening out there it's not he's praying to the father he's rejoicing in the spirit so yes notice like there are trinitarian relationships here going on he's thanking god that the truth about him and the kingdom has been revealed to this unlikely group of disciples not the wise guys not the people down in Jerusalem, the religious people. No, these people living out in the country. And it's hard to miss here, isn't it? That salvation comes by God's initiative. He's the one that is opening eyes and hearts to receive. Even as it obviously has to be received and believed by us. But Jesus' particular delight here seems to be how unlikely it all is. As the Apostle Paul would later say, God chose what's foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what's weak in the world to shame the strong. Again, the religious people didn't get it. This ragtag band of comfort country bumpkins did. By God's gracious will, they got it. Ultimately, that he would get all the glory and then once again, for good measure, Jesus pulls back the curtain to show us what's been happening behind the scenes. Verse 22. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal to him. So God is at work making Jesus known, even as the Father makes, uh, sorry, even as Jesus makes the Father known, 
But notice all of this wonder that's happening here doesn't just stop. Then he turns to the disciples privately, verse 23, and he says this, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. He wants them to understand the richness of what they're experiencing. He says, or I tell you, there are many prophets and kings who desired to see what your eyes are seeing right now, and they did not see it. And to hear what you're hearing, and they did not hear it. And so what did prophets and kings long to see and hear? What is the hope of the entire Old Testament where all of Scripture is pointing towards and building towards? that the long-awaited king was finally arriving to bring his kingdom. And what was the blessing these disciples received? Well, it was not getting to do cool stuff. <laughs> that was not it. But being able to see, to be eyewitnesses to what was unfolding, because not everybody could see it and not just seeing it and hearing it but actually belonging to the kingdom by God's rich grace through faith they got to be a part they were they were in and so back to back to Shaquille O'Neal Shaq had done just about anything, right, you could dream of on a basketball court and then off it. But when it came right down to it, it wasn't his athletic success, his wealth, his endorsement deals, his 76,000 square foot house that mattered. None of that mattered. It wasn't about doing in the end. It wasn't about doing in the end. It's not about what you have or what you do. But it's about who you have and who has you. What he craved was belonging, Shaq did. And Shag, by his own admission, threw it all away. So let's not talk about Shag, but let's talk about you and me. Isn't it the same for us in the Christian life? Like, how often do you just get busy doing? Doing. And I don't want to underestimate the sacrifices you make to do but doing in some ways is easy you just like do right you just kind of once you get in the routine you just do it right so like i come to worship it's good i, I serve in kids ministry god bless you thank you please keep doing that i, I head to my small group okay great good i, I make a meal for someone okay good i, I read my bible right I got, I, i've got a bible reading plan i'm going to right i, I got a or, or I'm, I'm going through, I, I got a Bible study meetup that I'm going to. I need to meet up with somebody, so I got to do that, right? I, I'm praying through my membership app, like praying for fellow members. Like, that's good. Keep doing that. I, I give my financial resources to advance this church and this kingdom. Good, do, right? But if you are not careful, this Christian life that we are supposed to be living can just reduce to that word, do. Do, 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 I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. There, there's always another thing to do. And gosh knows the pastors and other people around here are always asking to do other things, right? So <laughs> how can you, you know, you just, you just do. And the temptation to just get in that routine is great for all of us. Trust me, I'm talking to myself. But friend, you need to understand that the Christian life is not primarily about doing for Jesus. The Christian life is primarily about belonging to Jesus. It's about belonging to him. Fresh off of all those incredible things that they're out there doing, Jesus, I think, gently 
he's excited with them, but he sets them straight. He says, nevertheless, don't, don't rejoice in all of that. Don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's, that's the thing to rejoice in, Christian. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you, there are prophets and kings who desire to see what you see and did not see it and hear what you hear and did not hear it. Do you realize the blessing, the blessing of being able to see and hear and understand what God is doing in the world? Which brings me again to you and to me. Hey, friend, what is the overriding joy of your life? What is the best thing that's ever happened to you? The thing that when it is dark and gloomy in your world, that you can circle back to that and know, well, you know, at least I've got this. I have this and therefore it's okay. Jesus says rejoice that you belong to me, that you belong to him, that your name is written in heaven. Jesus says you're blessed to see what you see and hear what you hear. Like, are you amazed? Are you filled with joy that you're a Christian? I, not in some prideful way, like, please no. But in a dumbstruck way. Like, I, I can't believe that me, that of all people, I would have this privilege that my name would be written in heaven. I would see and know the things that I know. Friend, belonging is better than what you do. It's better than anything that you have. And if you belong to Jesus, that can never be taken away. Just listen in his own words how possessive Jesus is of his people. John chapter 10, where he says he's the good shepherd. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, never. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. It can't be taken away, because he's holding you. He gives you eternal life and you will never perish. If you are a Christian, you have been caught up into the grand drama of what God is doing in this world to bring about his kingdom. And while, yes, like there is a mission that is analogous to what they are doing, friends, like you can't lose sight of the really big deal. He doesn't want them to lose sight of the really big deal. The really big deal is that you are a citizen of the kingdom and an heir of the world to come if you know Jesus by faith. If you belong to Jesus, then that is better than anything. My football team lost yesterday. But you know what's better than my football team winning yesterday? Belonging to Jesus. I know that's trite. Belonging to Jesus is better than anything. I love how Dane Orland puts it in Gentle and Lowly. He says, it's one thing as a child to be told your father loves you. And you believe him, right? Like you, you take him at his word. But it is another thing, unutterably real, more real, to be swept up in his embrace. To feel the warmth to, to hear his beating heart within his chest, to instantly know the protective grip of his arms. It's one thing to hear he loves you. It's another thing to feel his love. And friends, this is what I'm, I want to push you toward. Jesus says, rejoice that your name's are written in heaven. You need to rejoice.
place, that's going to require you to an emotion, to, to feel. You need to feel. You need to be overwhelmed by the blessing of seeing what you see, of knowing what you know, of belonging to who you belong to. And that happens, friend, by instead of going through the motions and doing and doing and doing, like you have to move to a place where you actually commune with God. It's like prayer is work, but, but prayer is not us mainly bringing our lists to God. Like, hey, God, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. And if you can help me over here, that'd be great. Like, that's not prayer. I mean, it's part of prayer, but prayer is not about listing things out for God. It's about listening to God, communing with Him, knowing Him, and knowing who you are in relation to Him. Prayer is about, as Henry Nouwen says, about knowing that you are the chosen child of God, precious in God's eyes, called the beloved from all eternity, and held safe in an everlasting embrace. Dear brothers and sisters, I don't know if anyone has ever told you this, but I'm about to. Part of being a Christian is actually enjoying God. Part of being a Christian is actually enjoying God. Nevertheless, don't rejoice that spirits are subject, subject to you. Don't rejoice that you know, you're in a fancy football league with a preacher and he's about to beat you down today. No. Don't, don't rejoice. Don't rejoice in things that don't matter. Don't rejoice in things that do matter, but don't matter as much as this one thing, that your names are written in heaven. Part of being a Christian is actually enjoying God. John Piper is the one that popularized this phrase, and he's dead on. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. Part of the Christian life is being satisfied in God. So friends, just don't just do for Jesus, but enjoy belonging to Jesus. Actually practice communing with God through prayer and the word and, and worship feeling the warmth of his love and the grace of his forgiveness and that's not a switch you're going to flip that's something you need to aspire towards and work toward as you walk with Jesus that, that, that you get out of workload or, or uh, list mode and actually relate to and know God Here's how the psalmist Asaph puts it in Psalm 73, and we'll close. At the very end of that psalm, he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. His joy, of all the things on the earth, is not a thing that's on the earth, it's God. He says, my heart and flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That is someone whose joy is God. Friends, your joy, your satisfaction must be God. I, I, I said I was done, but one more. Psalm 63. This is David. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, have beheld your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I'm going to bless you as long as I live. In your name, I'm going to lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you on my bed and in the watches of the night. That's what it looks like joy in God 
for him to be your contentment and all you want and all you need. Friends, belonging is better than anything. I would press you to that. Let me pray. Lord, it's easy for all of us to get um, distracted and get pulled in different directions to go through the motions uh, to be busy and to be busy even for you and Lord certainly we have a mission that we must be on that we should be about Lord certainly we have a responsibility to you that we should uh, care about but Lord would you help us not to lose sight of the, the real thing the main thing the biggest thing in our lives that our names if we know you are written in heaven that we know you through faith that we have been bought by your blood God, I pray that that would stir in us ever just overwhelming, overflowing joy. Boundless, bountiful joy of being your beloved. And God, for those that me saying that here this morning feels weird or strange or we don't know how to get their spirit, I pray in ways that only you can, would you create that in our hearts to bring real, abounding joy for who you are that transform and drive everything about us and then cause us in turn to be on mission for you more faithfully God we love you thank you for what you have done for us through, through your son Christ and we pray it in his name